The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. Good morning to those on the um, West Coast, and good afternoon, early afternoon for those on the East, and all of those who are in the middle. Um, happy early lunch or lunchtime. Um, on behalf of Phi Chloritol Cancer, um, I'm Andy Dwyer, serving in a joint appointment with the University of Colorado Cancer Center and the Colorado School of Public Health. We're excited um, to invite everyone to the Medical Ethics and Right to Try webinar. Um, so right uh, before the webinar today, Sharon had noted to our keynote, Allison, um, who is our subject matter expert, um, that this has been a huge topic of interest. And I would say over the last uh, year, year and a half, we've had a lot of questions, a lot of discussions from the advocacy as well as patient education arena around Right to Try. So we're very excited to have Dr. Allison Bateman House, who's going to be joining from um, the NYU um, team to share a little bit about perspective. And I think um, particularly excited as her background around as an ethicist um, and sharing that perspective is going to be actually very engaging today. So thanks, Dr. Bateman, for uh, Bateman House for presenting. Um, just a quick note that we will be taking questions throughout the course of today's presentation. Uh, we'll share a little bit about how to do the, that and key in those questions um, at the right side of the panel. And uh, Sharon Worrell will be facilitating the discussion today. Um, the webinar archive um, for today and all webinars are on the Fight CRC uh, homepage, what, or excuse me, uh, website on the webinar page. And just a reminder that uh, there is a tweet chat um, that's actually following today's presentation. So in terms of social media, um, as well as pertinent and bite-sized pieces of info, check that out. Next slide. So a quick note about the uh, webinar feature. On the right-hand side of the panel, you'll notice um, there's a, a log me into go to platform. Um, that's the platform we're using. So you should be able to see the slides as well as um, the right panel. Um, use that control panel um, through the different types of uh, functioning and toggling approaches to go ahead and write in your questions. Um, just a quick note that we, if we have a ton of questions, we may not be able to get to all of them, um, but through another opportunity, we'll try to uh, tackle those questions and get those out through social media and other opportunities. Um, and then if you are new to GoToWebinar um, and you are ex uh, experiencing streaming problems, um, you can also use other things like the Facebook IM or Hangout during the presentation. And the audio tab allows you to either uh, use your computer or phone or listen in. So just take a minute, make sure that you're all set, ready to go. You've located those um, opportunities, um, that you're technically ready to go. If you're having any problems, uh, let us know as well in that chat feature and, uh, um, and we'll try to help you. Um, just a note, Fight CRC, in addition to today's um, type style of webcast, we also provide the mini magazines, which provide greater detail um, and almost a health type magazine approach around specific topics relevant to colorectal cancer. Um, so Dr. Tom Mercillier, um, as one of our advocates who um, we lost last year, but is a great um, person who was dedicated to clinical trials work, um, is featured on this specific trial magazine. Um, we're excited about getting these mini mags out to really touch on things like trials, skin toxicity and the like, to dig a little further into pertinent issues, as well as the Guide in the Fight, um, which is our uh, real foundational resource that really helps people through diagnosis, through treatment, um, as well as even through hospice care, thinking about different types of resources um, in management for patients and uh, co-survivors. And of course, the Tabuti podcast, um, where we try to bring out um, specific topics that should no longer be Tabuti and brought to the forefront. And um, that's really a, a, an interesting and provocative uh, set of topics. So a reminder, all of these are definitely on the Fight CRC site, um, available for download. And uh, when I invite you to today's webinar, uh, next slide um, with our team. Um, so just a quick note as we get ready to start, a uh, reminder there is no replacement for direct medical care. Today is intended to use um, for general education, uh, but any of the treatment or specific medical recommendations should come from a treating provider. And of course, if you're in any sort of emergent situation now or at any of Fight CRC events using the 911 or reaching out for emergency help is uh, definitely recommended. And um, another note that even during today's uh, podcast, or excuse me, presentation, uh, we will not be endorsing any specific uh, products or services. And um, just a quick note that we won't also be directly um, giving medical advice. 
about any specific um, medical or individual question that comes through. We'd like to keep it at the level of just general education and questions based on the topical information presented. Next slide. And I'm very excited again um, that Dr. Bateman House um, out of NYU has joined us today um, based on her expertise and in, um, in her appointment in the Division of Medical Ethics. So as noted, she has an extensive training with bioethics, um, public health, history, and really thinks about the, the historic um, and the implications around the human research and ethics of public health. Um, so I know that Dr. Hausman has a number of accomplishments and particularly uh, working with the Compassionate Use and Advisory Committee um, and is internationally recognized. And I really think that um, in addition, of course, to her co-chairing the NYU School of Medicine um, Group on Compassionate Use and Pre-Approval Access, I think it's really exciting to have someone um, who has a different orientation than we normally have brought in to, for discussion to really share um, the, 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 the different and dynamic um, uh, issues that are happening, particularly in the right to try area. Um, so uh, Dr. Uh, Bateman House, we're gonna go ahead and turn it over to you. And thank you so much for presenting. I think we're all very excited. Um, so Sharon and, um, and Allison will have you go. Before, as we're transitioning, I do wanna also send a huge thanks to the larger Fight CRC team. I know that um, Reese Garcia, as well as our uh, comm team, uh, so Nancy um, and Andrew are also on to help support, and then also the work that Sharon's doing. It really uh, does take a lot of behind the scenes work. So a huge thank you to the Fight CRC team who's supporting today. All right, so Dr. Bateman House, I will let you take it over from here. Thank you so much. Um, please let me know if at any point you can't hear me very well and I'll try to speak up louder. But thank you for the invitation to speak with you today. I'm delighted to have the opportunity um, as you can see on the screen right now, you have my email address and my Twitter um, handle. So if anyone wants to ask a question directly to me and doesn't feel comfortable doing it in a group setting, feel free to contact me and I will uh, do my best to get back to you quickly. Um, please do interrupt me today with questions because I'm here specifically to answer your questions um, and I would like to do that as much as possible. And I just want to say before I start, um, you can see on the slide it says that I co-chair something called the Working Group on Compassionate Use and Pre-Approval Access, or CUPA. Um, I've been interested in the topic of, you know, access to investigational medicines for 20-some years, and about five years ago decided it was time to finally form a international body to, uh, you know, actually research and, and make recommendations on this topic. So this group uh, is composed of academics, it's composed of doctors, it's composed of people from the pharmaceutical industry, people from regulatory agencies like the FDA and patient advocacy uh, individuals. And it, it predates right to try and there was no sort of a litmus test of, uh, you know, do you support or not support right to try in order to join the group. Um, but we all unanimously uh, are not in favor of the right to try law that passed, um, even though there are certain positive things I'll say about the right to try uh, sort of concept. Um, so if you hear me sort of having an omniscient presentation, speaking alternately from you know, the viewpoint of doctors or the viewpoint of patients or the viewpoint of uh, industry, please know I'm not just making stuff up, I'm drawing upon the work of this group. And if you have questions, I'm happy to answer them and or to, to discuss with you afterwards and either through email or Twitter. So with that said, um, oops, how do I go forward? How do I go forward? Anyone on the control side able to tell me? Oh, wait me down here. Um, yeah, yeah, there we go. I got it. I got it. Okay, okay so it, it was mentioned that I have uh, an interest in training in history. So of course I have to pull some history into here. Uh, many of you have probably seen this iconic image before. This is obviously from the 1980s AIDS, uh, you know, sort of peak tumult period. This is an activist whose coat reads, if I die of AIDS, forget burial, just drop my body on the steps of the FDA. And the idea was that, you know, AIDS was a deadly disease. There were no treatments for it. Yes, there were clinical trials, but they were few and far between and not many people were eligible for them. And patients said, you know, given that I'm going to die, I'd like to at least try uh, a possible 
treatment and if it kills me, what have I got to lose? Um, and the idea was very much that the FDA was some sort of uh, over overprotective obstacle that was protecting people to death. And uh, this was from the 1980s, but the concept very much continues to present day. You can uh, probably all remember this movie that came out recently, again, hearkening back to that era, but I think um, it was a very popular movie simply because this ideology still exists today. And these are some um, recent cases from probably the last four, five years um, of people who proceed access to investigational medicines through compassionate use or, or expanded access, which are terminologies I'll come back to in a minute. Um, and the thing that these people have in common, uh, they didn't all necessarily get the drug. Some did, some didn't. Um, sadly, no one survived. I'm just sitting here scanning real quick to make sure I'm correct about that. But one thing that was in common is um, these uh, individuals and those who were advocating on their behalf uh, pretty much always framed their battle as, you know, a battle against the FDA to get access to the drug. And that was not accurate. In every single one of these cases, the entity that was not allowing the patient to get access to the drug was the company developing that drug. And here's a very recent example some of you may have heard about in the news. Um, this is a change.org petition for this two-year-old who has a fatal illness. And again, um, in this case, the framing is actually asking uh, the company to, to provide the drug and acknowledging that the, the problem is on the, the company level, not the FDA. And that is correct. Uh, in almost every case that I can think of, when a patient is unable to get access to a drug, it is due to a company decision. And that's something that I'll talk about as we go along. So I do speak to companies quite a bit about how they should do compassionate use and, and what they can do to improve their um, policies. And what I tell them is, you know, the, the buzzword in industry right now is patient centricity, which no one really has a firm idea of what it is, but the idea is basically uh, everything that a company does should be in line. Um, regulatory innov innovation, there have been decades worth of efforts to figure out how to speed drugs through the FDA or other regulatory regulator uh, approval process. And the FDA, for the most part, has been very willing to, to try out new things and to see if they're helpful in terms of uh, getting the necessary safety and efficacy information about a drug, but still allowing it to get approved as soon as possible when that seems merited. Also in the industry, there's this huge idea right now about transparency that even if you make a decision that a patient or a patient advocacy group doesn't like, you should at least be transparent about it and let them know what the decision is, how they came to that decision, et cetera. Um, so I think when you take those three things and put them together, plus the fact that um, all companies have a fear of public pressure, and in particular, small companies, uh, you know, the, the large sort of multinational monsters of, of industry don't care that much about public pressure, although they would prefer to avoid it. But a smaller company really has a sort of deadly fear of public pressure. So when you put those things together, uh, I think all of these have led us to a situation at present where companies are more willing than ever to provide pre-approval access. However, um, that is not something very commonly understood either by doctors, by patients, by media. Um, and so we still very much have this sort of mindset that, um, you know, patients can't get access and it's an FDA problem, um, which I'm here to tell you uh, from every source of information I have been able to accumulate over decades of interest on this topic is not an accurate presentation uh, today. So. Um, but this ideology is what underlies the idea of right to try and oh, I'm sorry, that's so blurry. Uh, this is a book that was published maybe four or five years ago um, by a lady named Darcy Olson, who at the time was the president of the Goldwater Institute, which is a libertarian um, uh, think tank, I guess, for lack of a better word. 
Uh, and you can see the presentation is how the federal government prevents Americans from getting the life-saving treatments that they need. It, it, it very much perpetuates this myth that the FDA is what is standing between um, patients who want to try compassionate use. Now, I just need to be clear for a moment that compassionate use is getting access to a drug that has not yet been approved for sale, marketing, prescription, et cetera. So I'm not going to enter into the discussion of whether the FDA is an obstacle to getting new drugs on the market. Someone with a different skill set than, than I am would have to address that issue. What I'm talking about specifically is patients who want to try an investigational drug that has not yet been uh, approved to be just prescribed by a doctor. Um, that's the, the sort of world that I'm in. And um, I, this idea that the, the FDA is an obstacle in that world is not correct. Um, so here is a, a infographic put out by the Goldwater Institute, and they have this um, drug development pipeline uh, sort of timetable that I'm sure you've seen before, where the new drug goes through phase one testing, which is commonly called safety testing, although that's not exactly what it is, phase two testing, phase three testing, and only after phase three testing would you get to FDA approval. Um, Again, there sometimes that's not exactly true with some of this regulatory innovation, but for the most part, that is true. And you can see that there's a picture on the left-hand side of a person pushing a patient in a wheelchair and an arrow pointing at it says potential patient access three right to try. Um, so it's post phase one prior to phase two. We can talk about that, we will talk about that, but what I want to point out is missing from this infographic is the program that's been in existence since the 1970s called Expanded Access, whereby a patient who, uh, you know, does have no access to any other treatments and really has no therapeutic option other than that investigational drug can get access to um, that drug either pre-phase one, post-phase one, post-phase two, or post-phase three. At any point in this uh, timeline, you can get access via expanded access so long as the company is willing to grant it. So uh, again, it's the company, not the FDA, that is the gatekeeper. Um, and whereas right to try, now that it's a law, does potentially offer a pathway to access post-phase one, uh, I want you to keep in mind that there has been a longer standing program um, that provides the same access, except for in a, in a sort of um, wider sphere of arenas. And the other thing I want to point out about this uh, infographic is the sort of small font text at the bottom right. It's black text with a little bit of uh, blue writing says, while hundreds of thousands of people died from terminal diseases last year, less than 1,000 were given permission to access experimental medicines in the current system. So that is actually talking about expanded access. So they're saying less than 1,000 were able to get access to the drug they wanted to try via expanded access. For some patients, the process took so long that they died before they received the drugs or shortly after as their condition worsened. And there's grains of truth to that, but overall that is not true. And to, to show you that, let's go to this next slide. This is from a government um, accountability office, GAO report from I believe 2017. And I blocked out the big um, block in the middle just because it had extraneous information that we did not need. But basically this is saying request for expanded access that came in to the FDA. CEDAR is for drugs, CBER is for things like stem cells. Um, you can see the number of requests that were approved in, in the last fiscal year, fiscal year 2017. So at minimum, even if we just look at drugs, the minimum number of patients that were granted access would be this 1,632 number which, you know, if you think about a country of multiple millions is tiny. The, the thing that is not uh, widely understood is that these requests can be anywhere from one patient to thousands of patients. 
So you can see I wrote at the, the top, sort of the upper bound, the maximum number of patients that were granted access. I have no idea. The FDA has no idea. I don't know anyone who has this data. It's unfortunate. We would like to know this data, but at this point in time, we don't have any idea. I will tell you that I work with companies that routinely uh, provide expanded access to hundreds and sometimes thousands of patients for one single drug. So I'm positive the number is much higher than this. Sadly, I don't know what the actual number is. So that's just a little bit of debunking to get us started. And now I'm gonna try to go back in and hit some of the more basics. So we can talk about this if you wish, but I'm just gonna put out there as an assertion, the best way to get access to investigational drugs and other treatments, you know, vaccines, devices, whatever would be through a clinical trial. If someone wants to discuss that, we can, um, but I'm not gonna go into that in detail right now. But as I'm sure you're well aware, not all patients can participate in clinical trials. Uh, there's just not enough room for every interested patient to be in a clinical trial. The patient may not fit the enrollment criteria. Uh, the patient may just not be able to get to the clinical trial. The clinical trial is enrolling in say Denver and New York City, but the patient lives in Wyoming. Um, or even if the patient in Wyoming was willing and interested to travel to Denver, you know, every two weeks or whatnot, they just can't afford to do so. So there, there are numerous reasons why people cannot get access to investigational drugs that could help them via clinical trials. And of course, some people don't want to participate in clinical trials, and I'm not talking about that right now. Um, although if someone wants to bring it up, that up during Q&A, we can. So if I'm talking about a patient who wants to enroll in a clinical trial, but just can't, what can they do? Um, in some diseases, self-experimentation is popular. Um, I have no idea if that's the case for colorectal cancers, but say for uh, ALS, many ALS patients, you know, try, um, you know, X number of supplements plus dietary interventions plus whatever, and sort of swap these recipes back and forth in, in their efforts to come up with something that would help them and, and others with their disease. You can use an approved product in a new way or for a condition that the drug was not approved for. This is called off-label use and it's incredibly common. So this is, for example, if you um, are prescribed an antidepressant, not because you have depression, but because you have pain. Um, you know, that, that drug may never have been uh, approved by the FDA to be used for pain, but it's something that uh, just sort of anecdotally people have started using the drug for, and it seems to work in at least some people. This is called off-label use. It's different from what I'm talking about, which is use of a drug before it's approved for any reason. Personal importation from another country. Uh, it's pretty rare, but occasionally a drug will get approved overseas before it's approved in the United States. Um, again, I go back to ALS. There was a drug approved in Japan a number of years before it was approved in the United States. And so uh, patients would you know, order it by mail order and have it shipped in. So those are all options that some people use, and I'd be interested to hear what um, people on this call ha have experience with. But what I'm focusing on for the remainder of the time is pre-approval access. Again, access to a drug before it is approved by a regulator for any indication. And of course, the clinical trial is under the umbrella of pre-approval access, but we're talking about people who can't get access via a clinical trial. So again, access to a medical product before it's approved by a regulator and outside of a clinical trial. Uh, there are myriad terms used to describe this. I try to use pre-approval access. Um, compassionate use is a popular term with the media. I don't like it, but we don't need to go into that unless you want to. And now currently in the United States, there are two legal pathways by which to do this pre-approval access outside of a clinical trial. One is expanded access, which I've been talking about a little bit. It's under FDA oversight, and there's um, information here if you want to Google it to actually see what it says. And the other is right to try, which just became a federal law as of this year. I am aware of no companies that have agreed to make their product available via right to try. I honestly um, do not expect to see many companies avail themselves of this pathway to make their products available. And honestly, if a company did uh, 
try to use right to try, I would immediately have my radar antenna dinging and saying, you know, look and see what's happening here because uh, I personally see no reason why a company would use right to try instead of expanded access um, if they're being a bona fide legitimate company. And then there are 41 right to try laws, which I'll also mention as we go along. I'm going to pause for one second. Any questions before I go any further? Yes, there, we do have a question. Let me pull it up. Um, you mentioned that patients have access to right to try typically between phases one and two, phase one and two trials. Um, do their outcomes, you might talk about this later, but do the outcomes of these, um, of the patients get reported in the clinical trial results, even if they weren't part of a study? So first off, no patient has gotten access. So this is a hypothetical question. Mm -hmm. um, but no, the, the results would not be reported with the clinical trial data. Um, frequently, what happens is a company will say to the FDA uh, when it goes up for approval, it'll say, you know, here are, you know, 50,000 pages of data from our clinical trial. By the way, we also made our drug available to patients via expanded access. Uh, here's, you know, 10 pages of information about that because since they're not in a clinical trial, they're not doing all the same sort of data collection. It's just a question of, you know, were there any serious adverse events or something like that? And the FDA is willing to look at that expanded access data but it's certainly not determinative or decisive. Um, the clinical trial data is what the FDA is looking at for the most part. So if that did not answer the question fully, feel free to uh, send it back with a follow-up, but I will continue at this point. Thank you. So expanded access, uh, which I'm gonna talk about first because it's what is actually being used and then I'll come to right to try. Uh, according to the, the federal rules, this is for a case in which there is no comparable or satisfactory alternative therapy available to diagnose, monitor, or treat a patient's disease or condition. And it's limited to two groups of patients. You can see lots of text there, but basically I'll boil it down to patients who have life-threatening diseases or conditions, and they define it further here, or patients who have serious diseases and conditions. And as I'm sure you can immediately hone in on serious is like one of those squishy terms, which, you know, how do you define what is serious and what is not serious? Uh, the FDA honestly takes it a, a sort of the eye of the beholder. If a patient says this is a serious condition, the FDA says, okay, it must be a serious condition. Uh, I am aware of no circumstance and no one I've spoken to at the FDA is aware of any circumstance in which a request for expanded access was denied on the grounds that it wasn't a serious enough issue. Uh, it'll be denied on the grounds that, you know, hey, there's an alternative therapy out there that the patient hasn't tried. They need to try that before they try some untested, unproven, unapproved experimental product, but never denied on the basis of this is not a serious disease or condition. And my classic example I give to talk about serious disease or condition is something like blindness. Um, obviously, it's not life-threatening, but if you are going blind, it's very reasonable that you might want to try even an experimental product to arrest that process or possibly even reverse it. So that's a very um, reasonable situation in which uh, you would potentially do an expanded access request. Um, as I mentioned a second ago, this is not research. We're not necessarily collecting any data more than did something bad happen to the patient after they got the investigational drug. Um, the purpose of expanded access is to treat a patient who has no further treatment option available, either through clinical trials or through an approved drug. And there are several different types. You, this can happen in the case of an emergency. It doesn't have to be in the case of an emergency. Um, an expanded access request can be for just a single patient, or as I mentioned earlier, it can be for groups of patients, up to thousands of patients. So to give you just an example of that, if you said um, boys with Duchenne muscular dystrophy, I mean, that's a, that's a class of, of boys. Um, you know, it's a, it's a rare disease. I don't know the number off the top of my head, but you could have an expanded access request that would encompass that entire class instead of just, you know, John Smith individual patient. So this is the um, 
the slide I showed you a minute ago with that big um, purple block in the middle of it. And now I've taken away the purple block to go into the, the details. The point here that I'm showing you is that the large majority of expanded access requests that go to the FDA are a, allowed by the FDA to, to go on, the, the FDA permits them. So again, this is CEDAR for drugs, CBER for things like stem cell treatments. And if you just look at the middle number, which is the number of requests received, and then compare it to the number on the right, which is the number of requests allowed, uh, you can see that almost all requests are allowed. And again, um, as I was saying a minute ago, the majority of time when a request is not allowed, it's because the FDA looks and says, you know, there's an approved drug on the market that is reasonable for this patient to try and they haven't tried it, so you need to try that. Um, another circumstance that I've occasionally seen um, is the, the patient unfortunately passes away um, in between you know, when the request was, immediately after the request was submitted, the request was submitted so late in the patient's life that they, that they die. And then the FDA obviously doesn't you know, say go ahead because there's no point to go ahead, the patient has died. So uh, the point is it's incredibly rare for the FDA to be the reason to say no. Um, it also, if you remember that um, infographic from the Goldwater Institute that I read aloud from, it said that sometimes the process was so slow that even though the FDA did give permission, the patient died in the interim simply because of the, the length of the process. And yes, sometimes the patient does die in the interim, but it's not necessarily because it's a, a lengthy process. You can see I wrote here, it's a one to four day median response time, which I would say for any institution, uh, is, is quite responsive. So if it's an emergency request, the FDA promises a same day response. Um, you, if it's a truly emergency situation, you don't even have to fill out the paperwork for a request. The doctor can seek permission over the phone and they have a 24 hour call center at which that, that can happen. If it's not an emergency request on, on median, it doesn't go longer than four days for the FDA to review the sort of proposal and either say yes or no. And I have here that 11% of requests are modified by the FDA. So the idea behind this is say, um, I'm seeking drug X and I put in a request to the FDA. When I say I, I'm, I'm the doctor, the doctor has to be the one who does this. I put in a request to the FDA for drug X. Well, the FDA and looking over it says, hey, you know what? We also are getting information about drug Y, which is incredibly similar to drug X. And what we know from drug Y is uh, you should probably use a higher dose of drug X, or you should get it more frequently, or you need to have liver enzyme function test uh, you know, frequently or something. There, there's some data that they can draw upon that the company doesn't necessarily have available um, that they use to try to improve that proposal uh, in order to both make it more likely that the patient's going to benefit and less likely that the patient's going to experience harm. Um, and the 11% um, is sort of a very loose number. Basically, um, some scholars took 100 requests, just grabbed 100 that happened to have come in recently, and out of that 100 requests, 11 of them. 11% uh, of them have been modified by the FDA in, in terms of one of these uh, sort of parameters that I'm mentioning. So that's where that number comes from. So the point is the FDA is not the roadblock. Um, it permits things to happen. It is fast, it is responsive, and its review is not just, you know, a, um, uh, you know, a, a needless formality. There's actual experts looking at the proposal and trying to make sure it's the best it could possibly be. Any questions before I go on? Okay, so for any of you who have sought expanded access in the past, uh, you'll already know this, but for the rest of you, here's the process. First, you have to identify a willing physician who says, you know, yes, I think seeking an unapproved investigational drug outside of a clinical trial is the way to go. Um, sometimes that's hard. Uh, that physician in either on her own or in conglomeration with the patient need to come up with the drug that they're interested in. You can't just like say to the world, you know, hey, I want to try an investigational drug. You have to figure out what drug it is you're interested in. 
then that physician on behalf of the patient has to contact the company that is developing that drug. So I'm just pulling it out of the hat, Pfizer, contact Pfizer and say, you know, hey, I want to try your drug X for a patient who does not qualify for your uh, clinical trials of drug X and has no other uh, treatment options, but is seriously or life-threateningly ill. Um, the physician, the company either says yes or no, and, and it's up to the company. The, it is the company's product. The company has ultimate authority to decide what to do. If the company says no, you cannot sue them. You cannot do anything except for to pull this sort of like public pressure to bear, which is where you get those sort of social media campaigns that I showed a few of at the beginning of the presentation. Uh, basically, you can try to uh, shame or, or guilt the company into changing its mind, but there's no other way that you can override a no if a company says no. If a company says yes, that's when you get to these other points. The physician has to contact the FDA and in conjunction with the company uh, fills out a form if it's a single patient request, the form is uh, eight questions. It takes about 45 minutes on average. It's very short and sweet. It's not like trying to set up a clinical trial. Um, even for a group request, it's not nearly as comprehensive or extensive a process as trying to set up a clinical trial. The, again, the FDA reviews that request, either says, yes, it may proceed or no, it may not proceed. Then the physician has to get IRB approval at the institution where the drug's going to be used. IRBs are uh, institutional review boards. They're bodies at that particular hospital or, or medical center or research center or whatever that look over a proposal and say, you know, yes, this is ethically appropriate. We think we can ensure informed consent, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I am aware of maybe one or two instances in literally the last 10 years in which an IRB has not approved a request. Um, so this is actually more sort of a, a formality, in my opinion, than, a, than an actual um, useful step. But that's just my personal opinion. And um, regardless, the law is that it has to happen. And then finally, after the drug is administered to the patient, uh, again, if there's a serious an unexpected adverse event, this has to be reported to both to the company and to the FDA. And by serious or unexpected adverse event, if you're talking about someone who is already, you know, life-threateningly or severely ill, uh, you know, you're not going to be worried about things like, oh, they got a temperature or, you know, uh, had a minor allergic reaction. This is basically, you know, within minutes of the drug being administered, the patient dies. So th this is a very high bar of adverse event that has to be met for it to have to be reported to the FDA. Okay, so I'm hitting here some problems. I already mentioned that it sometimes can be hard to find a physician willing to do this, and we can discuss that if you're interested. Sometimes it's hard to figure out what drug you want to ask for, especially if the, the physician who's guiding a patient is not an expert in the field. If you have, a, a say, a general practitioner or an internist, they may not know what's in the pipeline for colorectal cancer and, you know, hence have a hard time figuring out what to ask for. Uh, it used to be identifying how to contact a company it was a big deal and very time consuming. I believe that that has largely been rectified in the last couple of years. We got a law passed that says uh, by the time a investigational product hits phase two testing, uh, the company by law has to have on their website public facing information saying what their expanded access policy is and a contact number. So either a phone number or an email address and information about how quickly you'll get a response from the company. So, um, you know, that's relatively new. We'll have to track it for a few years, but the indications thus far are that it is now much easier to figure out how to contact a company than it was. And um, this IRB approval uh, process, uh, again, there were anecdotal reports of that sometimes being a problem. Not so much at, you know, your, your Dana Farbers or your Mass Generals or your Johns Hopkins, where the IRB is, is active on a daily basis. But if you're in a rural hospital in, say, Minnesota, uh, it may not even have an IRB. So sometimes this was a stumbling block. Uh, again, I think this has been largely um, 
largely addressed. Uh, the FDA put out new guidance information for IRBs in the last two years that, that seem to have uh, streamlined to this a bit. And then there's also some workarounds that if anyone's having a problem with this step, I can help you with, just contact me. Okay, so that was expanded access, which is the, the process by which since the 1970s, patients have been able to uh, seek access to an investigational drug outside of a clinical trial. So now we have this new thing called right to try. Uh, it does not replace expanded access. They are simultaneous pathways. Um, and we're gonna go over the details of it just uh, briefly. And um, again, feel free to hop in and tell me if there are questions. So right to try says it uh, allows the use of unapproved investigational drugs by individual patients diagnosed with a terminal illness. So this does not allow for groups. This is only for single patients. It does not allow for serious illness. It only allows for terminal illness. Um, but as you can see underneath all my question marks, the language of the law defines diagnosed with terminal illness as diagnosed with a life-threatening disease or condition which are not the same thing. A terminal illness generally is defined as death is reasonably anticipated to be within six months, nine months, 12 months, something like that. A life-threatening disease or condition could be something like diabetes, where it's more likely than not going to have uh, mortality implications, but those mortality implications could be years or even decades off. So, so this is... Um, a sort of inherent contradiction, and it's one of the many reasons why companies are not uh, lining up to use right to try is because there are just some things in the language of the law that don't currently make sense and need to have explanations. Um, and we'll come back to more of those in a minute. So according to the law, again, you must have exhausted approved treatment options. If there's something out there that you haven't tried, you will be denied and have to go try it first. You have to provide written informed consent and you have to be unable to participate in a clinical trial. And there are certain um, guidelines about who it is who decides that you're unable to participate in a clinical trial because they're trying to prevent a system in which um, some doctor just willy nilly says, oh yeah, sure, these 15 patients um, are not eligible for a clinical trial. I wanna treat them through right to try. Um, you know, if that's not appropriate. So this was an attempt to create some safeguards. The definition of eligible investigational drug, as I already showed on the timeline, um, it has to be post phase one clinical trial. Um, so if it has not yet reached that point, then it's not eligible to be uh, used via right to try. It cannot be approved or licensed. Um, which makes sense if it's approved or licensed, you would just get it through a regular uh, prescription. It's a subject of an IND, which basically means that um, the investigational product needs to be in the development process under FDA jurisdiction and with oversight, um, and that there's no such thing as a clinical hold in place. A clinical hold is something um, where either in the clinical trial or in the expanded access, there's been a severe your adverse event that's so sort of shocking and unexpected that the FDA says you can't enroll anyone else until we figure out what's happening here. Um, we're going to come back to the process slide. You saw this a few minutes ago for expanded access, and now I have crossed out the things that do not apply under right to try. So you still have to find the willing physician. You still have to figure out what drug you want. You still have to contact the company and ask. It's still 100% up to the company to say yes or no, um, but you do not have to send the proposal to the FDA for, for approval. Uh, you do not have to seek IRB approval at the institution and those serious and unexpected adverse events do not get reported back to the FDA unless uh, um, some very rare circumstances with, with um, Oh, I, certain standards that are detailed in the law. Um, you can see on this screen, I have some question marks after the IRB part. The reason for that is the right to try law uh, does not require IRB approval, but in reaction to that, uh, numerous institutions are coming up with internal policies 
that either say we do not allow right to try uh, at this institution at all, or if we are willing to consider it, it must still have IRB approval. Um, so whereas I personally have some reservations about how useful the IRB is, um, institutions seem to be taking the stance with which I totally agree that if you're going to cut out the FDA, you have to at least have the IRB because otherwise you have no sort of disinterested third party who has an eye on this um, proposal at any point in time. So if you can't have the FDA, you should at least have the IRB, and I agree with that. Uh, I'm going to skip the saga and we'll go straight to this. Um, this is the 41 state laws that I was talking about, and this is not all 41 of them. This is um, an older chart and, and no new chart exists that I'm currently aware of. The reason I bring this up is there are certain things that were in the state laws that will continue to uh, remain law, even with the federal law on the books. So in some cases, things that were in the state law will get nullified by what's in the federal law, but there are certain aspects of the state laws that will not be nullified, and that's what is flagged here. So you can see in the center, there's a, a column that says patients may lose hospice coverage. So this says in the law, in the states that have the, the check, uh, that right to try law says if a patient uses an investigational product via right, uh, not product, drug, investigational drug via right to try, they may lose hospice coverage. Doesn't mean they necessarily will, but they may. Next column to the right, same thing. Patients may be denied home health care coverage. And, and the last column to the right, patients may lose health insurance. Uh, for up to six months after that investigational treatment ends. These are, in my opinion, not patient-friendly provisions, and they were not well um, uh, publicized at all. So I want people to be aware of those, particularly if you live in any of these states. And again, this is not a comprehensive list. Um, there are states that are simply not on the list. It doesn't mean that they're uh, free of these provisions. It just means they're not on the list. Dr. Bates, we do have a question um, okay. regarding this here. Um, so there are these rights to try provisions and implications. Are there any similar like this for um, expanded access? No. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, so this is a quick little comparison of access because that's what we're all interested in is getting access to the drugs from uh, expanded access via right to try. So you've seen this chart now three times. And again, this is the minimum number of uh, patients in the United States who got access via expanded access during the fiscal year 2017. It, the number is presumably much higher, but this is the minimum number. So the top part is expanded access. The bottom is right to try. Um, my group has been trying ever since Right to Try first came on the scene to find any instances of people using Right to Try to get access uh, to investigational products for patients. And this is sort of uh, what we have. This person on the right is a Texas doctor who um, was sort of the poster child for Goldwater, um, who used, uh, this is before there was a federal Right to Try law, he used the Texas right to try law to treat cancer patients. Um, as I said earlier, if someone used right to try versus expanded access, my radar was going to go off immediately. Um, we filed um, freedom of information requests and other uh, attempts to find out what was happening there. And basically this doctor had lost his uh, privileges from the FDA to treat patients with investigational products. So since he was not able to use expanded access, he was using right to try. Um, I don't know any of the details, but my hypothesis is that if the FDA takes away your ability to treat people with investigational products, it is probably not for a good reason and it is possibly not someone you want treating patients. So I, I have skepticism about that. The person in the middle, some of you may have heard of, um, he's a deeply divisive figure. There are those like myself who say that uh, Dr. Brzezinski is a, a quack who the, uh, the law has not been able to figure out how to stop treating patients. There are other people who say he's a miracle worker, so I'll, I'll let you decide 
Um, but I will simply say that the FDA and the Texas State Medical Board have repeatedly tried to uh, keep him from being able to treat patients. So again, I don't think this is like exemplary of what we want people um, being. And the, the final person on the right, whose name I don't even remember, is uh, brand new to my sort of list here. Uh, this is a article from August 16th. This looks like one big article and I'm, I apologize for that. It's not, it's, it's three um, cut and paste from one article put together. But basically you can see here, it says um, in the fight against cancer, you won't find a mixture known as Alice scan on the long list of drugs approved as safe and effective by the FDA. But a doctor in California has been peddling his own uh, $1,800 a month cure to desperate patients for years. Despite four years of warnings from the FDA, a patient lawsuit, blah, 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 blah. He's been able to continue doing this. And in the last line, you can see he argues he can legally sell this product to cancer patients under the federal right to try law. Um, this is one of the main reasons why I oppose right to try is I think it really has opened up a Pandora's box of people with uh, harmful or fraudulent intentions being able to uh, penalize or prey upon patients. And then my last slide that I want to show, and then I'm going to stop talking so we can uh, ask questions, is you know just a wrap up of why is expanded access better than right to try? Well, it, the right to try was premised on the idea that the FDA was the obstacle to access and it needed to be cut out of the process. It's not an obstacle. There's no data that shows that it is an obstacle. Also, when I talk with companies, they say, you know, why in the world would I give access to my investigational drugs to somebody who is already not eligible for my clinical trial? They're probably too sick or else, you know, they fall outside of the, the indication of my clinical trial. I'm already worried that this person might have some sort of severe adverse events. And if I am still possibly interested in giving them access to my drug, why would I do this without the FDA? looking over it ahead of time and saying, yeah, this makes sense, this seems reasonable, go ahead and do it. It's the FDA that I'm gonna to have to answer to if something horrible happens to this patient, I want to have them on board with me ahead of time instead of trying to explain to them later why I thought this was a good idea. So just on a practical level, this is why I think many companies are, are never going to go the right to try pathway. Uh, I have argued, and I won't go back over it now, that I think the FDA re review is useful pro patient and improves the treatment plan, and it's done in a very rapid amount of time. Um, uh, I'm not going to go into the details of this, but basically informed, uh, sorry, expanded access has meaningful consent provisions, right to try. Basically, you can give someone a piece of paper that says, uh, I give informed consent, and as long as they sign it, that that meets the letter of the law. Uh, I just talked about how Right to Try opens the door to bad actors, um, which generally are screened out as much as humanly possible uh, via the expanded access process. I just talked about the multiple state Right to Try, try provisions that I consider uh, anti-patient. I talked about how expanded access is designed for maximum flexibility um, how the data from those serious adverse events gets fed back to the FDA so that uh, they have that information, you know, two weeks later when the next request comes along instead of allowing more patients to potentially be harmed because they didn't have that data. And one thing I did not talk about that I'm happy to talk about if there's questions is Right to Try has a liability provision. Um, basically saying if you're a doctor, if you're a hospital, if you're a company, if you're a pharmacist, uh, any number of these, and an experimental drug leads to either a death or harm, you cannot be sued. I'm not totally opposed to the idea of a liability provision, but the one under right to try basically is uh, completely open-ended. It, it says, you know, full stop, you cannot be sued. Uh, and I think that's a bridge too far. So. Um, this last slide here, you can see this is um, the number of expanded access requests reviewed by the Food and Drug Administration from 2012 to 2015. And you can see numerically, uh, oncology is definitely in the top contenders, but it's not at the very top. Uh, there were more requests for anti-infectives, antivirals, and in hematology. And I guess the last thing I wanna take away 
from is not only is the company a gatekeeper to request, but but also you have to have that initial uh, request or else nothing's going to happen. There has to be an effort on the part of the, the patient's doctor to put forth a request for anything to happen. And just looking at these numbers, it makes me think that there's probably a room for more requests in oncology than are being made at the moment. So I'll stop there. Um, happy to answer questions. Thank you and so much. There's my uh, takeaway right there on the screen. We do have some questions um, for Let's you. Do it. Do it. Um, so while the legislation has just passed, passed nationally, it's been approved in other states in some capacity. Has yes. Rectify been used over the past few years in those particular states? And if so, what have been kind of the, the outcomes of that? So I mentioned that uh, when we were back on this slide here with these guys, the guy on the left, Texas doctor using right to try laws to treat cancer patients, um, treated patients under the Texas right to try law before the federal law. He treated about 80 patients. I have no idea what their outcomes were because they were not made publicly available. Um, the guy in the middle has claimed at conferences to be using right to try to treat patients. Again, I have no idea what the outcomes were. And then this man on the right has just announced that right to try is, is giving him the ability to treat people with his uh, drug mentioned here. But again, I have no idea what the outcomes are. Uh, I will say that um, the person on the left, the one that the Goldwater Institute used as their poster child, the product that he claimed to be using uh, has since been approved by the FDA. Um, there was an active expanded access program open during the time that he was using Right to Try. It was simply that he couldn't use it because of the FDA restrictions on him using investigational drugs for a patient. But, but thousands of patients did get access via expanded access to a drug that has now uh, gone on to be approved. So the drugs seem to be good. Um, but just one more sticky wicket is when we contacted the company, the company said that they were not actually giving this drug to this doctor. So I, I have no idea what it was he was actually giving patients. Um, like if, it, if he claimed it was Agent X and Agent X's developer said they were not giving him the drug, then I don't know what he was giving them. Next question. So emergency requests for individual patients for um, expanded access are usually granted immediately over the phone. Um, so would right to try be as quick a process as, as that phone call? I would imagine, I mean, this is hypothetical because nobody has, has been using it. I would imagine it would be uh, even faster because you're cutting out the FDA and the IRB part. Um, basically what it entails is a doctor putting in a request to a company, a company saying yes, and then shipping the product and, and trying it. I mean, in terms of steps, there, there are fewer steps. So I would imagine it would be even faster. Um, but I mean, that's sort of a moot point if no company is saying yes to right to try request at this point. Next. So what percent of NCI, NCI designated cancer centers do you know of estimate um, have medical ethicists on staff uh, versus a smaller community? Uh, treatment hospital, and how would a patient um, have access to a medical ethicist to discuss some of these things? Every hospital in the United States has access to a medical ethicist. If they're not on staff, they are available, uh, you know, by phone through a, a regional network of some sort. Um, it doesn't matter how small the hospital, it doesn't matter if it's private, public, NCI affiliated or not. Uh, any hospital should have a medical ethicist. And if you're at a hospital and you want to talk to them, probably your easiest way um, is either to say, can I talk to someone from the ethics committee? Or if they look at you quizzically and don't know what you're talking about, say, uh, I want to talk to someone from the IRB. And if they still look at you quizzically and don't know what uh, you're talking about, which I can't imagine would happen, but if it were uh, called patient advocacy, you know, the patient advocacy phone number within the hospital and, and say, uh, I want to talk to someone about 
uh, ethics issues and they'll be able to connect you with someone. And if not, you have my phone number and you have my email address to so give me a call. Great, thank you. We have one more question. And I think, I think this person is referring to a later slide um, like one of your last slides, the question is, what is the difference between Oncology 1 versus Oncology 2? That is an excellent question. I wish I could answer it 100% fully. I can't. Um, <laughs> that That's not my designation. That's from the, the GAO. Um, and unfortunately, I couldn't find anywhere in the report how they were differentiating between 2 and 1. Based on text, my assumption is that uh, 1, Oncology 1, is pediatric indications, or oh, sorry, pediatric populations, but I can't 100% swear to that. Okay. Um, if there's any more questions, uh, feel free to type them in and I can send them over to Dr. Bateman House um, and get a response out to you. So um, that is it. Thank you so much. What, a, what an interesting topic. And um, I know there was a lot of confusion. I think we, are very clear on kind of the steps in the process of each of these um, ways to, to access um, these, these medications. And um, yeah, can't thank you enough to be in house. Thank you so much. Uh, and I really do mean it when I say feel free to contact me with follow up questions because I know I covered a lot of ground very quickly. So please be in touch. Wonderful. Thank you. All right. Take care, everybody. Bye. Goodbye.